Well, I'm Michael Piotrowski, director of the Hermitage Museum, the State Hermitage Museum, which was called before Imperial Hermitage Museum. Today I'll uh, take you around the exhibition uh, a little bit to comment on the things maybe which are not exactly written in the catalogue uh, about some museological and some ideological things connected with Hermitage. Because Hermitage, like Prado, is a very special museum. It's a museum coming from royal collections and it reflects the history of Russia, the history of Russian culture, the history of Russian uh, Tsars and Russian political system, different ways of collecting, different problems of the big museum which is symbol of uh, our country like Prado is symbol of Spain. So as I understand now we have in the first uh, room and we have uh, pictures of main persons import, uh, who are important for developing the beginning of Hermitage. Uh, Hermitage has let's say two stages. One is an imperial one in Paris and another one when you go to contemporary art it's about the merchants because imperials as collectors and then the merchants in Moscow as collectors for contemporary art. Here you have Peter the Great, the person who opened Russia to Europe and who made Russia a European power. And we have Catherine the Great, a uh, person who founded Hermitage with her private collection and Peter opened the first public museum in Russia and Peter made Russia European. Uh, Catherine became Russian herself. She was German, but from all the line of Russian imperials, she maybe was the most Russian from a patriotic point of view and who was called mother uh, in Paris because she really has done very a lot for Russia to become a great uh, state. And we have a tragic figure of Nicolas I who made Hermitage a public museum, a person who loved art and loved museum. Also, he was not a very, uh, well, was a very, let us say, disciplined uh, emperor who demanded discipline from everybody, so he's not very much loved in Russian history. But I think all is nothing with comparison of making a public museum of Hermitage. It was he had a tragic life. He became emperor with, during and had immediately the next day he became emperor. There was a big rebellion of uh, nobles against him. And at the end of his life was the big uh, defeat in the Crimean War for Russia. So it's not an easy life with such a beginning and such an uh, end of, the li of life. But his main thing, I think, it's the building, the new Hermitage building, and making real museum life and uh, beginning the museum policy of Hermitage as an in the encyclopedic museum, museum which shows different cultures and which is the base of Russian self-conscious as a European country. Let's see. So, we go on. Uh, what I want to, you to see, you look at these chairs. It's a museological problem. When Nicholas uh, the I opened the public museum in the building of New Hermitage, he ordered these chairs which have been designed by famous architect Rossi for the palaces to be brought into the uh, museum building and it was a great idea of making museum like a palace. We now understand that this is absolutely right museological thing. Museum much look, must look like a palace. Another thing with these chairs, uh, chairs, now you see them are wonderfully restored, these Rossi chairs. For many years they have been not in very good condition uh, standing in the halls of the museum but they have been used by the people. They can sit on the, these chairs and some of the connoisseurs coming have been writing to some journalists. Absolutely unique thing. In Hermitage you can really sit on the chairs designed by Rossi. Some people who don't understand this reality have been complaining, oh they're a little bit not restored. You have to restore them. We do restore them. But when we restore them, we put them back but we put a ribbon on it. Nobody can sit on them now. That they have to put some new uh, chairs for people to sit. So this is uh, dialectic of museology. And certainly we begin with Imperas. Imperas names are always very important thing for the history of Hermitage. And with the views of the city of St. Petersburg. It's our beloved city uh, founded by Peter the Great. And you can see different um, aspects of the city. Here is the Peter Paul Fortress which I can see from window of my office in Hermitage. These are the churches which we have in St. Petersburg. You can see, I think you have seen pictures of Moscow. These churches are absolutely different. These are churches in European and Baroque style. 
which is a very special feature of Hermitage. Here you can see the Winter Palace, which uh, was the official palace of uh, royal residence and which one of the buildings of Hermitage. You can see the color. The color is yellow, sand yellow, and you have seen the color which is nowadays, it's uh, green. The colors changed uh, in different times, but never the green was never historical color. This is something like historical color. Uh, people all forgot what was the historical uh, color, so uh, when I, I personally introduced a kind of a discussion, explaining everybody, you know, the historical color is not green, this is the one. What do you think, and we ask the public, can have we go back to the historical color or we keep the one which belongs to the middle of the 20th century? And in a democratic way, it was said, people said, no, we want it to be like it is now. We are accustomed to have the green and white, and so we want it, don't want it to be changed. So we said, okay, if you are not prepared to the real historical change, we are not changing it. But with each new uh, restoration of the facade, we make the color lighter and lighter and lighter, so more pastel color, so one day we'll have what it is historically. That's how you team, uh, work with the architecture protection of the monuments. Uh, uh, Winter Palace, a royal residence with uh, a lot of uh, memoria for of the war with Napoleon, the famous military gallery, now perfectly restored. And here is a small throne room with a picture of Peter the Great, commemorating Peter the Great. If you have seen the film Russian Arch, I am an actor I filmed in this room when I speak with my father and previous directors of Hermitage. Now we are restoring this room uh, and we have found in Lyon the uh, velvet, the same velvet which they prepared to the, by the order of the Imperial Nicolas I, and uh, now we have the original one and we have to decide how we use the original one and what kind of bright color we can use or not too bright. You can see rooms of the Winter Palace, another mesological problem, for instance. This is a beautiful rotonda, uh, imperial room, where we, from time to time, make exhibitions. For instance, now there is an exhibition of porcelain, temporary exhibition for two, three months. It's good to have exhibition here also. It's much better not to have anything. It's always a problem when you have the palace. Rooms by itself are monuments, uh, objects of art, but when you put art into it, it has another function, new function of the Palace of the Museum. So we're always between different dilemmas, how you work with, how you use the, this building at the museum and how art is in the dialogue with all the surroundings. Sometimes it's very difficult. Like we have seen yesterday in Escurial, when the ceilings are restored and bright, it's sometimes difficult to look at the pictures. We have the same problem. We restored the new Hermitage and their beautiful, grotesque uh, ceilings. And so you have to decide where to put the light, to the ceiling or to the pictures. It's different with, in every room. So now we go into the collections and we begin with archaeological collections. We have these beautiful things like this comp of Scythians and different uh, objects of Scythian art. Uh, collection be which began with Peter the Great, its role of the emperor. Uh, one thing is very interesting. These things have been found in Siberia permanently. Peter the Great was the Tsar who ordered to buy them, not to confiscate them, to buy them and to bring them to the museum. And somehow he just managed to sell the last moment. Because after this, for 200 years, nothing was found in this region. Most of the gold was taken out. Then now we begin to find more to find more. So it's all very important to have some archaeological decisions in the right moment. Another thing which is very important, the things have been brought into Hermitage by uh, Nicholas, uh, Peter the Great things, and also excavations in the south of Russia. Uh, Scythians have been nomadic uh, tribes living from Siberia to the North Sea, moving from here to there, and developing different artistic styles, bringing together Chinese, let's say, Chinese Far Eastern style, and Greek uh, style of art, all together in their own way, of Scythian way, Scythian style of animal art and something like this. This is a wonderful comp found from one of the uh, barrels in uh, southern Russia. The uh, thing is that it's also part of very 
many, many years of study. It's a beautiful thing. It was done for Scythians because you see the Scythians trousers came to our civilization from uh, horse riding nomads like Scythians. Uh, fighting and also I think yesterday you there was here a lecture of uh, Professor Alexeyev, head of our archaeological department. He was the one who discovered that it is not just a scene of fighting. It's a scene commemorating fight between three uh, pre pretenders to be the uh, king of Scythians and he found the names and exactly the story how this battle ended and who became finally the uh, king and it was commemorating the, commemorating the victory. Most of these objects also have a lot of different kinds of explanations and discussions are going around them so it's always beautiful nice archaeology adventure it's always beautiful art and it's always a scholarly problems of history and writing, rewriting and understanding the history. Another part of our self-conscious coming from archaeology uh, is Greek gold. We have in Hermitage one of the best collection of Greek gold. Uh, the two, sec two other best ones are Metropolitan and British Museum. Once we had once an exhibition which was a fantastic exhibition bringing all together. What is the difference? Metropolitan Greek gold and Greek gold and British Museum are things brought from Greece recently, 19th century. All these, all these Greek fantastic pieces of Greek art have been brought, have been found in the barrels of uh, Greek colonies in the south of Russia. So it's our Greece. It's our Greek. <laughs> we have no, par uh, no Parthenon problems with them. But what's most important, it's also base of our civilization. You know, for all Europeans, you can call yourself European if you say, have some Greek, Greek and Roman remains in your country. You know? <laughs> then you can say you are European. So that's our, like the Scythians, is the base of self understanding of Russians and also wonderful cooperation, combination of cultures because Greek uh, jewelers have been working for the Scythians understanding their taste and doing something which will be look for Scythians, nice for Scythians, and the result was new artistic style. And also the influence, influence of Greek culture on the Scythians and other people uh, living in the south of Russia. You see all these absolutely beautiful things, masterpieces, and uh, also full of different historical problems, as I told. Uh, all these things came to Hermitage later, then the first paintings came because Catherine the Great, uh, she was a great ruler and we always uh, speak about her, the great ruler, also an example to uh, our rulers of today's because she understood perfectly well that to be a great country means to have a good army, good economy and have a very good museum collection. So two th first things everybody understands, the third things you have to educate and educate the rulers, sometimes they do understand. So she was collecting, she began to collect and it became kind of tradition, like here with the royals in Spain, that they have to enlarge the collection to buy things, and it shows that you are really great. So we go into the uh, painted collection, and there are a lot of wonderful pieces. We have brought here uh, such a collection of paintings which never leaves Hermitage for such on uh, on mask. This is a uh, Lorenzo Lotto. He uh, was recently really discovered and restored. We have a wonderful restoration laboratories, and we always, every year, well, every five years, we discover something in the paintings which are sometimes dark and not perfectly understood. This one's of the Lottos which have been uh, restored and became a beautiful picture, deserving to come replace. Uh, well, uh, Veronese, it's a great Veronese, it's, it's just stand and look at it. And San Sebastian is one of the last paintings of Titian, uh, wonderful. We have all these last paintings are uh, always very important also for our today's outlook. We also have the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt, one of his last paintings. They're very modern. Look, look at this, he was painting with his hands or something. It's very expressionist painting. We have a problem of immunity from seizure in our museum exchange. Uh, so this San Sebastian usually doesn't travel. There was a big exhibition in uh, um, London some years ago of Titian, so they asked very much to have this San Sebastian. Well, big exhibition of Titian, okay, we said, okay, we agree, but there is one political thing. We must have a guarantee that the picture returns. It's not the problem of property uh, or 
of the picture, but at that time, uh, a lot, not a lot, some companies in the world began to sue Russian government, thinking that hey, death, they owe them some money and trying to seize some property which comes outside of Russia. It happens all over the world. We said that we now demand always a guarantee that things will come back. It doesn't mean that if you send something to the exhibition, it must come back, it must be guaranteed. At that time, British said, you know, we are a very democratic country. Our judicial system is absolutely independent. We can't give you any guarantees on something like this. Okay, okay, no guarantees, no tissue. Then it took three years, no titians, no big pictures, no this and that. Perfectly, they now have a law which guarantees everybody immunity from seizure if there is important exhibition coming. So we are changing international law a little bit. We all together because these issues of immunity from seizure have been discussed many times in our meetings of museums who organize exhibitions and our colleagues have been there and there. So we press our, all the governments to make uh, art protected during these exhibitions and so on. And Well, this is a wonderful El Greco. We don't have many El Grecos, but it's a wonderful and also because it's also it's the moment when St. Paul says this famous thing, no Helen, no Jew, everybody, all the people are the same or uh, equal. And this is maybe the one of the most important phrases in the uh, history of uh, Christianity, that's exactly when he's saying it, because he's approaching, as, as you know, the story Peter, after he made some mistakes in uh, working with people and proselyting uh, people. Well, classical art, and classical art, and classical art, and Karachi, and uh, now when we look at our Velasquez, our only Velasquez, I want to congratulate our colleagues here for the design of the exhibition. The exhibition is perfectly designed. All design, all the system, all the, let us say, uh, dialogues between the pictures and the lighting. If you remember in Hermitage, we have this big hall of Spanish paintings, and you can't really properly see, because it's difficult to have the right lighting. Here you can see, and you see that the picture, this bodegon is uh, bright, wonderful, and looks great. Well, here our part of our Spanish collection, which is for us extremely important. We're very proud that Hermitage was the first uh, museum in Europe outside Spain to have a special department for Spanish art, not just a general one. And speaking about the dialogues, here it's uh, Velasquez and Caravaggio, and here you have San Sebastian and San Sebastian. This is one of the famous Caravaggios, uh, lute player, one of the great masterpieces of Hermitage, also with the story, you know, here on the table, you see the text and the notes of the Madrigal, which is played by this lute player. It could be recognized. And this year, we had a special musical evening in uh, Senat in Rome, and the company was playing music of Time Caravaggio, including this Madrigal, don't forget how it is called, because it is, exists. Another story, you see these flowers and the fruits there. They're not very fresh. It's a symbol of things that things are never fresh. They go are a little bit rotten. And they have all the smells. And we had a, one of a, a very a revolutionary exhibition in uh, Hermitage with the help, with the idea of one of the perfume makers in Italy. Uh, she combined the perfumes or the smells of all the um, flowers and, uh, veg and, and fruits which you have there. So it has been several, you smell one, 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 and then it was all combined and brings you a real smell of uh, the picture. Certainly it's a little bit of adventure, but it really worked well, and then she produced a special uh, kind of perfume called Lutnista by Caravaggio. I think the t smell is terrible. Yeah. It's like uh, Caravaggio, it's a very special. Uh, try to imagine the music and smell. And here are our Rembrandts. Oh, some of them, this is a fantastic scholar picture. It is one of these pictures when the picture looks at you and you feel very uneasy because he is doing some important things and you come and he looks at you and, and wants to say, what are you doing here? I have things to do. Uh, and this is another Rembrandt 
also another small mythological story. Uh, the title says it is about uh, Haman uh, knowing his uh, fate. Uh, it's the story of Esther. Esther, when the Artaxerxes sends uh, Haman and while well, makes the proper things for the Jews, and he was the persecutor of the Jews. This is a wonderful story, well known. But there is another story and another title for this. I think, from my point of view, the same also possible. It is uh, David and Uriah. Yeah. You know, Uriah was the husband of Beersheba, and when David decided he wanted to marry Beersheba, he sent Uriah, who was a great military commander, to a task which was really will end with his being killed. And uh, so I think the title, it, and now he's Uriah who knows, he knows that he's sent to be killed, and he goes and leaves that side. So both explanations are possible, and in many things in art you never know exactly what was meant by Rembrandt. Another story, political one. Once you had President Clinton in Hermitage, bring him around, and there have been a lot of journalists. And in some of the places, journalists have been asking him questions. And just before he came to Rembrandt, they asked him questions about the uh, Russian church, persecution of church in Russia, and so all these religious issues about people from the people who are very much anxious about how religion lives in Russia. And then we came to Rembrandt, and I said, well, it's David and Uriah. And he turned to the journalist and said, do you know this story? So the president of America has to explain American journalists the biblical story, which is not a very rare one. So uh, museum was always part of the court life, and here we have some glimpses of glimpses of court life in Russia, uh, in the Winter Palace, and uh, you can see the uh, official robes, which had been used in the uh, ceremonies in the palace, and you see the clothes of Nicolas I, the founder of the new Hermitage, in his military costume of the Hussars, General of the Hussars. And this is the robe, or ceremonial robe, of Maria Fyodorovna, a fantastic person. Maria Fyodorovna was a Danish Princess Dagmar, who married Alexander III, uh, was mother of Nicolas II. Uh, when Alexander III died, uh, she became the king mother, and she was very influential in uh, Russia before the revolution. And uh, during the revolution, after the revolution, he was one of the strongest persons in Russian uh, history. By the way, very beautiful. You can see her shapes, how good her figure was. When the revolution happened, she lived in Crimea, in the south of uh, uh, Russia, and the British sent a destroyer to take her out to Britain. But she lived with, uh, there have been uh, entourage around her. She said, I am not living alone. You take everybody who is with me, then I go. So they agreed to take everybody, also it was not planned so. Then she lived in Britain, then she lived with her relatives in Denmark, and she was a such personality that even being the king mother in exile, she was very influential in all political and non-political things in, uh, in Denmark. There is a small anecdote about her when she lived in Denmark. Uh, her, I think her cousin, the king, said, complained that she was living in the palace, she was using too much electricity. And she, as a, as a response to this, she opened the electricity in all five buildings she was living and get it for all night to show that it's not a way to speak with the former uh, Tsarina of Russia. Well, and you see all this uh, style of the clothes, which is, and here we have another clothes and a lot of gilded bronzes. Gilded bronzes became part of important part of royal life uh, in Russia. And uh, this was done by the school of Tamir. Tamir, the famous uh, jeweler making objects from bronze and gilded bronze. And a lot of things have been done for Russia. 
Uh, also, as with the Greek and the Scythian, changing the style a little bit. You see, it looks a little bit more barbaric than a normal French uh, furniture. Because, well, it was given, made for one of the nobles, not for the Tsars, and they wanted to be more gilded, a little bit more of bronze, a little bit more of gold. It's like, like with the Greek and Scythian. So it's always interesting dialogue of uh, cultures uh, showing also who the artists are and who are the people who order the art. It's, uh, we are very proud, certainly, well, Rubens and Prado are Rubens of Prado, but we are proud of having some landscapes of Rubens, which are uh, rather rare. And beautiful collections of drawings, as I know, my colleague Dedinkin was giving a lecture on the drawings in Hermitage collection. Certainly the Dutch collection of Hermitage is very good, began with Peter the Great, because he liked loved Netherlands, he liked them very much, and he collected, and Catherine collected, and it's our love, uh, Dutch art. Uh, things like Metsu, uh, and uh, then we have a picture of a person whose portrait you have also here in Prado. It's uh, Russian ambassador Patyomkin, who traveled, where he traveled, he made portraits made of him, because it is a portrait made by him when he was in Britain. And then there's a portrait made when he was uh, in Spain. Well, certainly such kind of clothes, traditional clothes, will have been very interesting for everybody to see. This wonderful Franz Hals, one of the first paintings which came to Hermitage. The uh, story is well known. There was a war between Russia and Prussia, seven years war. Uh, uh, it was in the time of Catherine the Great. Uh, and uh, at this time, a uh, dealer, by uh, name Gotskowski, a German dealer, collected for Friedrich the Great, who was a great collector, a big collection which he wanted to sell to him. But as a result of the war with Russia, and it's the war where we have for the first time entered Berlin and so on, he had no enough money, he had to choose. Oh, he makes use his money to keep his porcelain factory alive, or he buys the collection. So he decided he's not buying the collection. And Catherine the Great, the women in the war, bought this collection. Uh, and this one, one of the pictures which came here. It has many shades of black. It's a fantastic picture, many shades of black, something like 40 shades of black. So, and definitely what is extremely important, I think, this is a thing which also says a lot also about, about art and about the collection of art. This is Bernini. Uh, this is the St. Teresa, which is in the church in Rome. But this is not marble, this is uh, terracotta. So this is a bozzetti, it's exactly done by Bernini's hands. So this is a real one, and you see how fantastic it is. And there is another story. It was brought from uh, Italy by Paul I. He traveled there before he became emperor. He traveled in Italy, buying something. Uh, it was called Prince du Nord, it was incognito. And he bought a big collection of Bozzetti from uh, Fossetti collection in uh, Venice. At that time, you had to have good taste to understand that this is exactly the things you have to buy. It was rather cheap, not very expensive, and it's the things which you have to buy. So we are now very proud of this. It was an Academy of Arts, and now it uh, will in Hermitage. And while well, it's uh, one of these really real things, like sometimes in uh, Titian and uh, Rembrandt, you can see the um, prints of their fingers on the paintings. So here you can see the real uh, life. Uh, another mythological thing. This Potter, the uh, wonderful picture of a dog, is saying that the main thing for me is to explain to the people there is no principal difference between the dog of Potter and the cat by Picasso. There's no revolution in art. It's, it's all the same. It's a different language. They change dialects a little bit. But this is one tradition. Well, here we have a very important collection of neo of classicism, or neoclassicism. You call also with it was discovery of uh, classical art in Rome, which also came in the time of Catherine the Great to uh, Russia and uh, was recognized, then a little bit forgotten, then 
now it is re-emerging as a well recognized. This is Canova. Canova is a great example of a great artist who was very famous. Then in the from in the 20th century he was built considered too classical, too primitive, not modern, not avant-garde. And just in the 60s and 70s, and we are proud that our collection played a role, the fame of Canova is returning back. And Italians and not Italians begin to appreciate how great Canova is. Well, this beautiful Chardin, which was ordered by Catherine the Great directly from Chardin. When people are discussing us going into contemporary art, saying, oh, good, Hermitage is going into contemporary art. Well, we say, no, nothing new. Catherine the Great was buying contemporary art of her time. Uh, here, this wonderful Belotte view of Dresden, another political story. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, when our former president, prime minister, and maybe future president Putin comes to Hermitage, he gets, he always likes to show to the visitors the pictures of Dresden by Belotto because he worked in Dresden when he was uh, the Russian spy in the GDR and he loved the city so he well, always tells me, I, I, I was here, it was, it so he liked Dresden. So, so we have in Hermitage we have this kind of a roots and places who said what, says what when they visit Hermitage, the, our presidents and foreign presidents and so on. Well, French art, Boucher, Chardin, it's not the time of Catherine the Great, and certainly Voltaire with whom uh, Catherine was uh, exchanging letters. And now from classical art to art of uh, jewelry, we have seen the ancient art. And here are some collections of oriental jewelry and European jewelry. This comes from collection of Catherine the Great, this uh, filigree of Chinese filigree. Uh, two things, two scholarly uh, problems connected with this. First of all, all this service, the Chinese service was dispersed and it was not very well known if it is Chinese, not Chinese, it was in different uh, departments of Hermitage. It was all collected, understood, studied, and then restored. Now we have a new laboratory of restoration of jewelry and these filigree uh, things have been restored with the use of modern technology, lasers and all these kind of things. So we are proud of, proud of it as an object and as a result of our restoration, restorer's work. Another symbols of empire. These are beautiful examples of Islamic art, some of them coming from Central Asia, which was conquered in the 19th century, and some of them coming from collection of Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah, the famous, famous Persian conqueror, conquered Delhi and ended the dynasty of great Mughals. And he plundered the, well, not a collection, the treasure of great Mughals and sent uh, embassies to different places to send gifts and to tell how great he is. So this part of this uh, collection, gifts sent by Nadir Shah to the Empress Elizabeth. Well, the embassy took several years to come to St. Petersburg and we changed several rules, but end was get Elizabeth the, uh, I. So this is Indian jewelry and Central Asian jewelry. And here European jewelry with a lot of legions. Well, one of the biggest Spanish caravella, one of the biggest uh, emeralds in the world. This is the wonderful, all those have legions and stories. They say that this uh, earring belonged to Francis Drake. Nobody knows right or not, but well, good legion is a good legion, right? Uh, this is the wedding box of uh, Princess uh, of Jagiellon family in uh, Poland, with uh, interesting use of more ancient jewelry as a part of decoration of the. All this comes from our treasury. We have a special department called treasury where we can have all this. And here you can see some examples of our church art, which was uh, things which have been used in the church of the Winter Palace. This beautiful snuff boxes. Uh, this great collection of flowers made by Jeremia Poesier, the person who made the crown, official crown for Catherine the Great. They're beautiful. Imagine when they're all on very uh, thin, 
uh, ropes. Imagine when you have it on the rope and you move, all this is moving and glittering. This is snuff boxes. One has a portrait of uh, Elizabeth and one belonged to Friedrich the Great. Friedrich the Great is, uh, well, I figure, very much important for our history because uh, king of uh, Prussia, uh, because Catherine the Great was always in competition with him. She was learning from him and also in competition. So now we have a big exhibition on Elizabeth, uh, daughter of Peter in Hermitage. And for me, the main uh, thing in the exhibition is the hat of Friedrich the Great, which he lost running from Russian army in the Battle of Konigsdorf in the Seven Years' War. That's how art is always connected with the, the history of uh, in Hermitage. And I think it's a great thing that you use an escalator to go to contemporary art. Here we have beautiful portraits by Anger, and here we have Kaspar David Friedrich. And it's another story still of Imperus collecting contemporary art. These pictures and other pictures by Kaspar David Friedrich was bought by Nicola the uh, First. Bought uh, for by himself from the uh, atelier of Kaspar David Friedrich in the time when he was very famous in Germany but not famous outside Germany. He just liked the pictures and he brought it for the, his personal rooms and then they came to Hermitage. So let's we always I'll mention also this when we talk about contemporary art and Hermitage it's, and personal taste of the emperors. They did have taste and they have been choosing things they uh, liked very much. But here now we go to the merchants. There have been several merchant families in uh, Russia who began to buy a lot of contemporary art. They had a very good end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, a good understanding what will be in the future, the good businessmen. They knew the price of the futures in 20 years. Uh, there are several names, but I will begin with Yeliseev. Yeliseev was one of the merchants who had the biggest shops, food shops in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. He was collecting Rodin. And the family was very educated. Uh, and then two famous names, uh, families, Shukin and Morozov. Uh, Ivan Shukin, Sergei Shukin and uh, Ivan Morozov and other Shukins and other Morozov have been collecting modern art. Because Sumatis, Impressionists. This is a wonderful thing we managed to bring here. This uh, great Spanish painter making the portrait of Ivan Ivanovich Shukin, brother of Sergei Shukin, who was uh, strong in buying Matisse's. I think it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful picture. It's very Spanish. It's very modern. Uh, and it fits perfectly well here. You know, it's, you understand the, the whole story much better than you have it when you have an Hermitage. By the way, it's always so interesting to have exhibitions of Hermitage outside Hermitage because you can have different way of looking at the things, different ways of lighting for temporary exhibitions. All things, you can see a lot of new things in your uh, own uh, collection and remember it. Well, so they have been buying these Renoirs, Gauguin's. With Gauguin, it's another museological story. I'm sure that Gauguin is becoming to be the most famous artist of this period because he had no relatives. And you can make exhibitions, you can publish uh, pictures without asking, without paying money, without asking the relatives. You can even make uh, not only postcards, but some souvenirs without Matisse family saying, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't. And it's a big problem. Problem of copyright is a problem when you speak about the art must be accessible to everybody. You must remember that there is a copyright. And I think we have to enter with some of other people into this fight for more freedom in uh, copyright things. Also, it's uh, both sides. We, because we have copyright for the pictures which we have, and we fight everybody who does something without our permission. But, well, we have to find a balance. The collections of Shukin and Marozo have been nationalized after the revolution, and uh, made, they have, a museum was made of this collection, and then it was a museum of modern art, uh, new Western art, established in Moscow. At that time, uh, they established museums in Moscow, and they wanted more classical paintings for Moscow. And something like four or five hundred masterpieces of painting from Hermitage have been given to Pushkin Museum in Moscow, which had, didn't have a lot of paintings. And then in the 30s, some of these paintings came to Hermitage as an exchange with Moscow. 
and then after the war, the Museum of Modern Art was closed because it was modern art was not very much fashionable, and what was uh, the rest had been divided between Pushkin Museum and Hermitage. And then this art, how this art played a great important role in the history of Russian culture. They had been brought to a museum which showed the history of art. And when you show the history of art, you can show even the art which is considered bad one to show to the people. So uh, our colleagues in Hermitage, this was previous and previous generation, they said, well, we have to show them. They think, oh, yeah, it's decadent, imperialist art. So yes, it's bad. But I have to show everybody that how Poussin is good and this is bad. And so step by step, they showed these pictures. And when I was young, it was very famous, the third floor of Hermitage, classical modern art. People will be coming, all the young people coming and looking at classical modern art. At that time, there was no way to travel and so to see things. The generations have been educating into good taste in modern art, thanks to the things being shown in two big museums, in Pushkin Museum and in Hermitage, as a part of art history. <coughs> Certainly this wonderful uh, Picasso's, and then it's Cezanne and Wandongan is one of our best things. Here is another story. Uh, this is Sutin, the only Sutin which exists now in Russia. And it was bought to Russia by us, by Hermitage. We bought it. And it's another story, very much political one. Uh, 1996, there was, had been a president election. President Yeltsin was running for election. And it was very difficult because the Communist Party was uh, winning, kind of could win the president election. So President Yeltsin was very active in different kinds of showing how good he is. And I invited him to Hermitage, writing to him, you know, no first person in Russia after Nicolas II ever visited Hermitage in his official capacity. Please do come, show to the people of St. Petersburg that you are interested in this imperial Latin. He came. He came and signed a good decree about Hermitage, about his patronage, about the Hermitage, so on. And also promised that if he will become president, he will give us money for acquisitions. We thought never. Well, never the candidates <laughs> do what they promise when they become president. And, and acquisition for museums, never for many, many years, there was the biggest problem. You can get money for restoration, but acquisition, oh, out of the question. So we thought it will never happen. It happened. After a year, we got the money, and we think this good thing was that at that time, the head of the controlling committee of the president's administration was Putin. He came from St. Petersburg there, and so he was controlling how the decrees of the president are realized. So it's partly him, partly Yeltsin. So, and we have bought something like six, seven paintings in the line of Chukin Morozov, Utrillo, Ruor, and this Sutin, and so on. So we do collect, and the history develops. And we still, we use the art, must use the rulers. It's what, what are they all for? Well, great Matisses, you know, well, Matisses are in Russia are the best, some of the best Matisses in the world. And also the story of Shukin as collector. We know that certainly Matisse dance is a very special thing. Shukin was collecting Matisse, but he also was as a collector telling, well, I want this, I want this, make it smaller, make it bigger. In a way, it's a wrong thing. Artist is artist. But somehow, which in Shukin case, we know that things improved, became better because of this kind of a dialogue between the collector and the artist. Things like this. So this is one of this, our best uh, Matisse's, the dialogue, certainly it's Matisse speaking with his wife. And so there is a drawing in the Louvre of one the, of uh, Babylonian sculptures, which uh, Matisse has drawn in the Louvre. And it is, this is uh, the kind of a replica of this. Uh, ancient sculptures which he used because Matisse is one of those great examples of how oriental art and ancient art was inf not influenced, was used by him to do something absolutely modern. We have another picture which looks like a Persian miniature only on big scale and things like this. This is another story. This is Matisse sculpture by Henriette. Uh, Matisse had secretary who was Russian Lydia Delektorska, beautiful lady. He made a lot of portraits of her. And she kept some of Matisse's things. And then in the <coughs> 60s, she donated things she had to museums in Russia, to Pushkin Museum and to Hermitage. Some paintings, some sculpture, 
and belonging. So that's how Matisse collection became even big. And she was a wonderful person, by the way. And she gave us the, also this uh, sculpture of Henriette, one of Matisse sculptures. But we have two sculptures of Henriette. Another was given us quite recently by the company called Sarah Lee. It was a famous company which had a collection and then they decided to give this collection to different museums of the world. Uh, so they gave us, gave us another sculpture of Henriette. Uh, but was even more interesting, uh, Sarah Lee was maybe one of the first foreign companies, maybe the first made a donation to Hermitage. Imagine Russia, Soviet Union collapsed, museums have no money at all, and we are trying to learn how to get money. And we know that people out in all over the world have donors, give messans, get monies from them. So we began to work somehow on this, and we had the uh, first, uh, the president of Sarah Lee coming. I was a young director, and he said that, well, he knew the situation. He said, well, I want to give you some, several thousand, not big amount for the museum. At this moment, we even didn't know how to get this money to the museum, how officially to get it through the bank. All, it was all against the old Soviet system. So this is how we began to learn. We managed to get his money, and then we managed to get other monies, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and now we have quite a lot of uh, donors and sponsors in uh, Russia and outside. So it, it's learning. The museum is always learning how to appreciate art and how to get art. And this is Kandinsky composition number six. From my point of view, one of the best uh, things done by Kandinsky. Frankly speaking, when we are talking about contemporary art, I say, you know, it's, it's not a problem, also a problem to collect contemporary art in Hermitage because we do have some of the best pieces of the 20th century. Matisse's Kandinsky number six and Malevich Black Square, the whole philosophy of contemporary art is here, in a way. Oh, uh, this picture uh, wasn't shown for many years, even when Matisse's had been on show, it was not on show. And it was a period when you had a very good thing in Hermitage. You have things which you can show only for your friends. Well, that's what when I was a child. So. For instance, it was a perfect treat, you know, when people, have been, uh, scholars or artists have been brought in the uh, inside the storages of Hermitage and shown this Kandinsky for the ceremony. I've participated several times. People come, it's like a <coughs> going to the Holy of Hollies. You see this. Now it is normally hanging. A great thing. It was uh, done for the Museum of uh, New Modern Art in Moscow. And this is one of our recent acquisitions. It's certainly the great thing by itself, the Black Square by Malevich, and also one of the examples what we are doing uh, in Hermitage, and yesterday I sent uh, Mr. Arango, the chef of the patrimony of Hermitage, of uh, Prado, that will show. Uh, I will end with mentioning the head of the Board of Trustees of Hermitage, Mr. Mr. Potanin, it's who bought it to us. It was quite a story. This black square was found in some of the cities on Volga and bought by a bank. Then the bank uh, went uh, bankrupt. and. All the, way, the due, all the debts went to German companies. And so they had to sell the collection uh, as a collateral for the debts. And head of our um, board of trustees, Potanin, he's head of Interos, one of the richest people of Russia, that he wants to buy it for the Minister of Culture and give it to Hermitage. But to buy it on a, for one million dollars, you know, it costs much more. But in Russia, if you can't take it out of Russia, in Russia it was at that time more or less normal. But also one has to persuade the Germans that it is possible not to try to sell it more, but to sell it for one million so that it goes to Hermitage. So I personally was summoned to the meeting of many Germans who were responsible for the bankruptcy of this bank to explain them why they have to agree to sell it to the Russian state and to Potanin to the Russian state. Well, thank God they all agreed. Gravel, and it came to us, and it is, uh, well, it's very simple, but well, we begin with Kitanat, and then with this, it's the whole story of uh, Hermitage. So that's some of the things which I'd like to tell you about the Hermitage and how these objects do live inside the Hermitage Museum, because Hermitage, it's a big, organism, it's a big country, it's a big house where everything lives, everything has its own function in the rooms, outside the rooms, in the storages, the architecture, so and we are very happy and very grateful that 
some of the spirit, a big part of the spirit of Hermitage has been transferred here uh, to Prado, thanks to our uh, colleagues and to this, and thanks to the generous exhibition of from Prado, which we had in Hermitage. It was the greatest event in our this sort of last year. Crowds of people have been coming and are uh, Prado here, the best pieces of Prado. So thank you. <laughs>